this is our topic today, the seed and the seventh day. So I'm going to get uh, into this and then let's just browse through. And, you know, maybe maybe you'll pick up something new on one of the slides, which will just uh, make other things that we've discussed in the past fall into place, you know, or it'll just give some more clarity. So again, please note that there's no particular topic today. This is just sort of an overview of uh, the puzzle pieces of the Bible and how they all fit together. Okay. Uh, some interesting things I do want to say along the way. Nevertheless, let's uh, let's have a look at three scriptures in the Word that I want to use to introduce the seventh day. Where did it come from? What is it all about, uh, etc. So I'd like to just show you the very first one there on uh, on the left is Genesis two verses two to three, and uh, just some of the key points that I've highlighted in in, in yellow there. It says on the seventh day. God ended his work, which he had made, and he rested on that seventh day from all his work, which he had made. Part of, part of the creation process, of course. Uh, then it continues, and God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it. In other words, made it holy, all right? Because that in, uh, uh, in it, he rested from all his works, which God had created and made. Okay, so just... Take note of the yellow text in that uh, verse and just store that in the back of your mind for now. We're going to go through two more verses and then I want to tie them together. In uh, Ezekiel chapter 20 verse 12, it says this. Moreover, also, this is God speaking through Ezekiel, right? Part of the prophecy. God says, I gave Israel my Sabbaths to be a sign right, between them, me and them that they might know that I am the Lord that sanctify them. And hallow, hallow means to dedicate effectively, right? So the Lord continues through uh, uh, Ezekiel prophesying, he says, to hallow or to dedicate my Sabbaths. And again, my Sabbaths will be a sign between me and you. Through, through Ezekiel, God speaking to Israel, that the Sabbaths are there for a specific sign. We will discuss more of that sign just now. So here we've got that God rested on the seventh day uh, from all his works, and he, 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 uh, he blessed and made the seventh day holy, and the seventh day also uh, is a sign to Israel for something specific. Okay, so we move on to the next slide, and the third of these three verses I want to just introduce. In Hebrews, the New Testament this time, Hebrews 4 verse 4 uh, through to about verse 10 or 11. It says, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works. Again, he limiteth. Now, this is the King James, right? He limiteth, but the word limiteth there means designates. In other words, God designates a certain day, saying to David, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Right? This is the day of salvation, in other words, that is being spoken of here. And then it continues in verse 9 to say, There remains therefore a rest to the people of God. For he that is entered into his rest, he also has ceased from all of his own works, just like God did from his. Let us therefore labor to enter into that rest, lest any man fall uh, after the same example of unbelief. Okay, so there's a lot to say about that verse there, but the key that I want to pull out from, from that little passage is that there is an appointed day, a certain day, in other words, that God has designated, and that certain day uh, is a, it remains a rest for God's people. Okay, so if we tie all of this together, which is going to sort of bring me to the point that I want to raise here. If we just summarize everything there, God, from the scriptures we've uh, we've just read, God rested on the seventh day, and he blessed it, and he made it holy. For Israel, the Sabbath is a sign of a greater blessing. Uh, in actual fact, that passage that we read in, uh, in Hebrews, that we've just read now, if you read through it again, and you sort of dig deeper between the lines, there's actually about three different rests that are spoken of in that passage of Hebrews. I just want to give you pointers. It's not on the slide now, but just a point here. The first 
type of rest from Hebrews 4 verses 4 through to about 11. The first type of rest that he's spoken of there is the actual Sabbath days that Israel under law had to practice, right? That they had to rest on the seventh day um, throughout the law from Moses, right? That was a law um, itself. Um, so it speaks of the seventh day, that Saturday Sabbath day that, uh, that they had to rest. But then in that same passage, it also alludes to or it points to a rest for the Israelites after they ceased from wandering in the wilderness over that 40 year period. And then, of course, entering into the promised land. So in other words, the fact of entering into the promised land via Joshua became their Sabbath, right? That was basically a Sabbath as well. And a, and a feast, if I'm not mistaken, was dedicated at that point as well. And then the last thing that Hebrews 4 through to 11, uh, chapter 4 ver, uh, uh, refers to is, I think, the ultimate rest, all right? The ultimate rest for God's people is when they will enter into the kingdom, that millennial kingdom reign of Jesus Christ when he comes back down at his second coming. So uh, that is the rest. Uh, in actual fact, coming back to this point on the slide, let me get my laser going. This particular point here, right? For Israel, the Sabbath is a sign of a greater blessing. Now that sign that, I was, that we read about in the scripture is, is definitely, in other words, God was saying to Israel through the law as well, that you rest on the Sabbath. Every Sabbath is a rest, but the rest there was more to, how can I say, remind Israel that there was a greater blessing on the horizon, right? In other words, each week, these, the, the last day of the week, they would drop their tools and they would rest. But God was saying, in this rest, realize that when Christ comes again, that kingdom that was going to be ushered in onto earth was going to be the thousand years of rest for Israel. So, Basically, like everything else, like almost like every law and every feast and every ordinance effectively that Israel uh, practices, it all points to something greater, whether it be Christ, whether it be that kingdom, whether it be the rest that is being prophesied here. OK, so um, this was effectively the sign that God was giving Israel to remind them. Future wise, there is something greater on the horizon. Right, and that was also the day that was appointed. It's an appointed day, but uh, as Ryan actually pointed out earlier, as uh, part of the, uh, <laughs> Ryan, that it's actually, the day is actually a thousand years, right? We will see that in scripture shortly. So, uh, and then of course, the last point that uh, we, we can extract from all the scriptures that we started off with is that the Jews were encouraged to labor. All right, remember they had to obey the law uh, it was part of the gospel of the kingdom, right? That they had to do works, that they had to labor in order to prove their faith in order to be saved and enter into that kingdom when Christ came at his second coming. Okay, so there's a lot involved there, right? Um, uh, this is all to do with the, the end result is that thousand year kingdom reign of Jesus Christ and the rest that Israel will have from all their works and all their sufferings. Uh, throughout the eons. Okay. Right. So that was the recap. Just something else about the thousand years. Where's the scriptures that point to this? Many of you, I'm sure, will know these scriptures, but uh, very clearly the scriptures point out about a thousand year reign of Christ, which is that Sabbath rest, which we've been uh, referring to now. But in Revelations chapter 20, it says, and he laid hold of the dragon that old serpent. So remember, Revelations, this is way out in the future now. Well, not way out. It's actually just around the corner, to be quite honest. But during the uh, tribulation period, of course, uh, coming to the end of the tribulation, those seven years, um, the scripture reads here that uh, he laid hold of the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years and cast him, this is Christ, of course, after he comes back at the end of the tribulation period, right, and saves Israel and so forth, Christ binds up Satan and casts him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more. 
till the thousand years should be fulfilled, and after that he would be loosed then for a little season. Okay, and I saw thrones, and they that sat upon them. By the way, they that sat upon these thrones is the um, the twelve disciples. Remember in Matthew or Luke, Jesus. After the disciples say, Lord, we're laying down everything for you now. What will we have at the end? And, and Jesus says, well, you know, you will be kings. You will be sitting on 12 thrones reigning over the 12 tribes of Israel during that thousand year period. Right. So there it is. And I saw thrones and then that sat on them and judgment was given unto them. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. OK, so there were, there is pretty much. I mean, how many times have we got just in that uh, little passage of scripture? A thousand years. <laughs> it's surprising to me always how people that don't want to accept the millennial reign, that it's a physical reign of Jesus Christ on earth after the tribulation. People can't see that. And I mean, how clear is the scriptures yet? But then they still twist it and try and make other things out of it. OK, nevertheless, Peter and uh, Brian, this is, of course, the scripture that you alluded to earlier. Uh, 2 Peter 3 verse 8, but beloved, do not be ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. Okay, so that's also a fairly famous little scripture, but it also proves to the point that, you know, for, for the Lord who is outside of time as such, uh, a thousand years is as, uh, as, as short as one day. But one day can also be as long as a thousand years. OK, so uh, taking all of that into consideration, here's a very interesting question I want to ask. As simple as this, right? It simply says, if the seventh day is a thousand years, does it not stand then to reason? Is it not logical then that there are six other days that lead up to that thousand uh, year seventh day? Right? If there's a seventh day, that's a thousand years, it, this logic says that there must be six other days that lead up to that day. And those six days are similar to the thousand year period as well. All right, this is not to scale, by the way. It's not drawn to scale. <laughs> All right. But anyway, there's that Sabbath day. So this is just a, a, you know, I like my charts. So there's the little, the Sabbath day representing that thousand years as the seventh day right at the end. But then we have these six thousand year days that are that are leading up towards that sabbath day and of course the sabbath day is the millennial reign of jesus christ as the words on the, the slide represent what i do want to get into now uh, to represent what happened through these six days right leading up to the the seventh day is just let's follow what i call the seed there is Obviously, Jesus Christ is prophesied throughout the six days. And uh, let's follow that, that the thread of the seed as it runs through history throughout these 6,000 years. All right. And um, the Bible, of course, gives a lot more detail. We're just going to pull out highlights you know, from here and there. Otherwise, we can discuss this for, for weeks. Nevertheless, let's get into the uh, next slide. So if we look at the very beginning of the first day, we know, of course, these stories. I'm not going to get deep into this. Uh, the idea is not to go into in-depth uh, views here and so forth. But uh, let's follow that seed, all right, and pick out the scriptures that deal with the seed that eventually comes and will establish his rule in that seventh day. So we see over here that Adam and Eve, of course, sinned uh, right after creation. And um, they were deceived, of course, by the serpent. And then in Genesis chapter 3, verse 14 and 15, it reads the following. And the Lord God said, so this is, of course, where Jesus had come down into the garden, right? The Lord God, which we know is Jesus Christ. Um, and he was going to speak a curse over Adam and Eve and the serpent because of uh, the rebellion and, and the violation of, of um, eating the fruit right, uh, of the tree of life. Oh, sorry, good and, and, and evil. So anyways, uh, it says, and the Lord God said unto the serpent, unto Satan at that point, because you have done this, deceived Adam and Eve, you are cursed above all. And I will put enmity 
which is basically the word hostility or bitterness, right, or separation. I'll put enmity between you, Satan, and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. All right, so notice we are following the seed now, right? So this is the very first prophecy or promise, if I can call it that, of the fact that there is going to be a seed a blessing of God given to mankind who will restore things again down the line, okay, and bring forth that Sabbath day, that seventh day. So uh, when he says, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed, he will bruise your head and you will bruise his heel. All right, so this is the first time that we hear of this prophecy or this promise of a seed to come through woman. Okay, now of course we know that the seed of woman is Jesus Christ, who will bruise the head of Satan, right? That will of course happen when Jesus comes again at his second coming and sets up that kingdom, right? That thousand year reign. Because remember, that's when Satan is locked up, right? Uh, for a thousand years. But then Satan also has a seed. Now, please note, obviously it's not that Satan bore children, right, on earth, but the seed of Satan is basically rebellious men, mankind, right? So you'll see there on the point on the slide, thy seed, as in Satan's seed, is effectively throughout history, but more so at the point of Jesus' crucifixion, is rebellious men. Um, Jesus called them you generation of vipers, okay, and which is significant. You'll see in the scriptures further down. But anyway, um, these men were the seed of Satan that bruised Jesus by basically crucifying him. Okay, so in Matthew 12, verse 34, we see Jesus himself say, oh, you generation of vipers. Now remember, uh, right there in Genesis chapter 3, right at the top here, um, Satan was known as the serpent, a snake, right? So Jesus here, of course, is saying to the Pharisees and those that were leadership in Israel who were constantly rejecting him, he said, you generation of vipers. Matthew 23, you serpents, all right, giving the same name as what Satan was known as in the Garden of Eden, you generation of vipers. And then even clearer in John 8, verse 44, Jesus says, you are of your father, having seeded these rebellious men, the devil, right? You're of the, your father, the devil. Okay, so that generation of vipers is essentially the seed of uh, Satan, which was spoken of there in the Garden of Eden. Uh, they crucified the Lord, and that's that's where they bruised his heel. All right. So there it is. Um, that's the first reference to the seed, which we know of is Jesus Christ. Um, let's follow the seed throughout these six days and uh, may, maybe just pick out further details in Scripture, which either will bless you or give you some you know, sort of uh, cues as to how everything fits together at the end of the day. All right, so let's move on to the next one. So um, as you can see, we know that this is now, here's Noah, right, in the, uh, in the beginning here of the second block. So basically a thousand years has occurred from Adam. Now uh, I'd like to actually just point out how, how we know that. If you look uh, at, the, at the bloodline from Adam to Noah, right, now this is taken in, gen uh, in Genesis. We have the, 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 the ages of these, um, uh, these patriarchs from, you know, the ancient times. Um, Adam, that was his age. And then Adam's son, Seth, was born when Adam was 130 years old. Um, and Seth lived up till that particular year and so forth and so on. But anyway, if you look all the way down to Noah, Noah was, uh, was born 1,056 years after Adam. Okay, so we know, therefore, that this is 1,000 years and then Noah was born. All right, so at this time, right, have a look in Genesis chapter 6, verses 4 and 5. It said there were giants in the earth in those days. In other words, in the days of Noah, a thousand years after Adam. And also after that, when the sons of God, which were these fallen uh, angels, right, um, headed up by Satan himself, came in unto the daughters of men and bore them children. And these children became mighty men, which were of old, men of renown, right? Giants, they became the giants. 
uh, of earth. And uh, it continues, and God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of their thoughts, of their heart, were only evil continuously. Okay, so this is now happening in the day of nowhere. Now, I want to draw your attention here that, remember, in our previous slide, if I just go back there again, it's always good just to come back. When God, or Jesus, gave this promise to mankind, all right, that, the, uh, that the, the, their seed will bruise the the head of Satan, in other words, will conquer Satan, will defeat Satan effectively. Um, Satan, of course, understood this promise. He understood that there was going to be a future date when he was going to be defeated. So what Satan ended up doing during these thousand years from Adam to Noah was to attempt to corrupt the DNA of humanity, right, to sort of destroy the gene pool of humanity. And this is where he got these fallen angels to connect up with women and to, to, to give birth to these giants, which, which were not God's creation, right? Um, it was a corrupted humanity as such. And um, it's interesting that it, it all comes down to the sort of the editing of DNA, all right, uh, itself. And why the flood took place is because it became so corrupt that God had to destroy this because it wasn't part of God's original creation anymore. Satan himself, of course, as you can see, was attempting to destroy the DNA of humanity. Why? To actually destroy the seed, right? In other words, to, to bring an end to that promise that God gave Adam in the Garden of Eden to say that a seed will come in the future that will destroy Satan. Okay. Kathy, absolutely. Cloning starts started then already, <laughs> right? That was the first cloning, right? And the and the first gene editing and whatever else you want to say there. But that was Satan's uh, plan. He said, right, well, if there's a seed coming out in the future, if I can corrupt humanity on the DNA level, then that seed will become corrupted and it'll put a, 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 a sort of, it will stop God's plan. So this was the idea here, and this is why we can then understand that God had to destroy it with a flood. All right. Um, notice Genesis chapter nine. Uh, sorry, Genesis six verse nine. It says Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations, and Noah walked with God. Now, you know, a lot of people think that the word perfect there, describing Noah, is that he walked with God in perfection, that he was a good <laughs> a good Christian, not that Christians existed at that time. Uh, you know what I mean, all right? He was in relationship with God. Perfection there, the fact that it says Noah was perfect, has got nothing to do with his relationship with God. It's actually meaning there that Noah was one of the only people still on earth that hadn't been affected on the DNA level with the corruption of Satan's plan. Okay, so that's what the word perfect says. It says Noah was perfect in his generations, and he was probably one of the lost ones. Okay, so um, uh, this is, of course, where uh, God put Noah and his family on an ark and destroyed the rest of that, uh, that hybrid creation that was going on at that time. So... Um, Interesting to see a few, uh, you know, sort of things that we're confirming here is the fact that it was a thousand years after Adam. So that's this is what happened in the first thousand years, the absolute corruption of the humanity DN on the DNA level, and God wiping that out and starting afresh with Noah. Okay, um, I don't know how much uh, emphasis you guys put on numbers in the Bible, but um, you know, there's obviously significance in numbers if you think in terms of the 40 days when Jesus was tempted in the desert, the 40 days when it rained at Noah's time, right? The fact that Israel was in the wilderness for 40 years. I'm just giving the 40s now, but there's also seven and there's also 12, right? 12 tribes of Israel, 12 disciples, 12 this and that. Numbers have significance in the Bible. The number eight significance is new beginnings, and it's just interesting to note that it was that Adam, 666, Anton, absolutely, right? The number six is the number of man, right? And triple six is, of course, the, um, the ultimate uh, number that represents corruption of mankind, humanity. So, uh, but anyway, the, the number eight, significant that Noah and his seven were eight in the ark, 
and that represented new beginnings, which, by the way, we can also even tie in now, right? The seventh day, seven, is a day of completion. The, the seven means completion, right? So the seventh, that Sabbath day, right at the end here, is the completion of God's plan. And after the thousand years of this Sabbath day is ended, we get into the eighth day, which basically there isn't an eighth day. I'm just saying that after seven is eight and eight is new beginnings, which basically is the beginning of eternity future where we will be um, in God's presence, that we will dwell in a new Jerusalem on a new heaven and new earth and so forth and so on. So eight again there, new beginnings. OK, just pointing it out. Right. Uh, I thought, uh, you know, let's let's take. Let's just take uh, because there's no specific uh, um, topic in this lesson today. Let's just deal with a whole lot of interesting little facts and figures. So uh, interesting in this regard that uh, Satan was trying to corrupt humanity to destroy the seed. All right. God judged that, wiped that out and started again with Noah and that family of eight as a new beginning uh, in order to continue the seed. So notice how I've actually put up here how God preserved the seed, right? That promise of a seed started with Adam. At this point of time, a thousand years up the line, God had to preserve that seed line. All right. So let's get let's see where it goes from here. All right. So moving on to the next slide. So now we get to the beginning of the third day, right? And this is Ad, uh, sorry, Abraham. This is the uh, the next promise or the next covenant, I would like to say, right? Or the next significant uh, period in Bible history where the seed is spoken of again. And we, we will see that just now. But um, all right, just consider here, right? Remember, we were talking about that Noah started off this second day of a thousand years. So with uh, the flood that happened here, Noah, of course, and his sons had to replenish the earth, right? And of course, we have this whole thousand year period, but within this thousand year period as well, there were some other things that happened, which we will get to shortly. Okay, so just take note of that. Maybe you can start thinking already, right? What happened there that led up to Abraham? <laughs> okay, but here's just what I want to introduce with from Abraham's position. Suddenly, at the beginning of the third day, Right. God calls out this one man out of humanity. Now, remember, there's no Jews and Gentiles at this period of time. Right. There's no Bible at this point of time. There's no uh, there's no written word. All right. Every single person on earth at this time in Abraham's day was basically a, a worshiper of the sun or the moon and, and so forth and so on. Right. So God pulls out this one man, Abraham which we know was actually a moon worshiper <laughs> with his father, Terah. Okay. And he calls this one man out and he says, uh, he, he gives this most incredible promise that, I, that he must get out of his country and his father's house to a land that God will show him and that God will make of him a great nation and bless him and make his name great. And he will be a blessing. And then have a look at the last part here. And I will bless those who bless Abraham. And I will curse those who curse Abraham. And in Abraham shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Now, as you can see with my question over here, why did God do this? What was going on? Why, what was this incredible promise given to one man all about? OK, well, we just got to consider sort of what happened at this time just before Abraham. What was going on in the earth at this point of time? So just having a look at this, if you guessed correct, right? Um, within this period of time from 400 years, in other words, think of this as 600 years till about the beginning of Babel here. All right. Um, so Babel occurred uh, about 400 years to the end of the full 2000 year period at this point of time. And uh, obviously, uh, again, I'm not going to go through the whole detail of the Tower of Babel, but uh, it was where God had to come down and stop the plans of men, right? And confuse the languages in order to separate them, to sort of disperse them across the world, right? Because uh, here in Genesis 11, um, interesting to note that the first 
11 chapters of Genesis covers a period of 12, uh, 2,000 years. <laughs> All right. In interesting. I mean, just 11 chapters, 11 short chapters, but it's 2,000 years worth of uh, time that, uh, that, uh, that goes by. All right. And uh, it just says here that um, he said, go, uh, let us, this is what they were saying, humanity at this time, let us build us a city and a tower whose top may reach into the heavens and let us make us a name. All right. Now, I'm not going to get into the details of the meaning of the Babel Tower and all these, these things, but it basically boils down to uh, the Babel, all right? This whole account represents rebellion in men, right? The fact that they were building a tower, uh, and the tower effectively always means worship. If you read in, in terms of towers in the Bible, it's always connected to worship. They were trying to build a tower that would, would reach to the, the stars, the celestial bodies, because that was what they were worshipping at that time. And they forgot about God. Uh, just read Romans chapter 1. Right? It says there that they became, they became more interested in the creation than in the creator. And they worshipped all the things like the birds and the creatures of the earth and whatever else. Okay? They forgot about God. So it was all to do with rebellion all right, uh, in this period of time. And this is also what Abram came out of, right? So when God called Abraham, it was, Abram was part of that humanity at that time that had no written word. There was no Jews, Gentiles. It was one race of people. And um, I, I just believe, I can't confirm this, but I but just believe that Abram had faith in his heart. So that when God called him and said, listen, go to a land that I will show you and I will make you a nation and so forth. This was... Uh, God approaching this one man that would believe in him. Okay, the rest of humanity again were sort of rebellious and uh, coming to the point of the same thing as, you know, being uns unsavable, <laughs> if I can call it that. Okay, but nevertheless, so that's what happened during that time. So now we have this one man, Abraham, and let's just get back to the seed component, right? I can't believe my time. I'm not even going to finish the, the pace that I'm going here. I'm not going to even finish this. <laughs> I may have to just finish this next week again. <laughs> so, but as long as you guys are enjoying it, you know, and, and interacting and, and learning along the way. Here's an interesting little fact. Uh, I was referring to Romans chapter 1. Thanks for the thumb up. I was referring to Romans chapter 1, uh, which basically uh, is, you know what? I don't know if you ever heard of it in this scenario, but Romans chapter 1, 2, and 3 is, is a court case. It's almost like uh, going to court with a judge, right? And Paul, who is writing Romans, is laying the case before humanity and saying in Romans chapter 1 that you heathens, right? He calls them Gentiles in Romans chapter 1, but the whole Romans chapter 1 is pointing to the fact that that the, the period of time, all right, the first two days of the humanity's history, um, they were without God. They forgot about God. They, 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 they ignored God and they abandoned God and they did their own thing, right? And uh, Paul lays this out, that Gentiles or heathens in that day were unsalvageable. They couldn't be saved. Okay. Uh, of course, in Romans chapter 2, he lays the case for the Jews, the fact that the Jews also, uh, you know, forgot about their Messiah uh, uh, completely. They killed their Messiah and so forth and so on. And, go, and a court case against the Jews was that they were also, like humanity, they were unsalvageable, okay? And Romans chapter 3 then places the, the indictments, as you can see on the slide there, the court case. It puts it on the whole of humanity, uh, heathens, Gentiles, Jews and says that no, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. All right. And of course, this brings then, of course, into Romans chapter four, the salvation of Jesus, the seed component again, that Christ would come and have to rectify that situation. So um, just an interesting thought there as well. If you've studied Romans in that scenario, the first three chapters are like this court case right there where, where Paul basically just lays out that humanity uh, was was useless without God, and that uh, God had to step in and save the day. All right, but let's get back again to Abram. Um, I'm I'm so caught by the time here. I see it's quarter to one already, you know, and I'm basically only halfway through. I would have thought that I was 
going to be finishing this whole thing this <laughs> this week. But um, anyway, we will just continue next week uh, itself. But uh, let's let's have a look at this, right? So we are back here with Abraham again. And remember, I said that we were we were going to be following this seed, this promise that was given to Adam, where God had to preserve it through Noah. And now we are at Abraham. So where do we find a, a the the continuation of this promise of a seed that will be coming? And we find it here in Genesis chapter. 22, right, with Abraham. And it says here, the angel of the Lord called unto Abraham out of heaven. This was where Abraham was going to be um, killing Isaac on the altar. Okay. And the Lord God called to Abraham out of heaven a second time and said, by myself, I have sworn, says the Lord, for because you have done this, had the faith to follow through and kill Isaac, which by the way, is a representation, a shadow representation of what God was going to do with Jesus. All right. Uh, it continues there to say, and hath not withheld your son, your only son, that in blessing I will bless you, and in multiplying I will multiply your seed as the stars of heaven and as the sand which is on the seashore. And your seed shall possess the gate of your enemies, and in your seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because you have obeyed my voice. All right, so here is another scenario just reiterating this promise of a seed that is coming up the ranks here through these 6,000 years, all right, uh, leading up to the salvation of, of humanity in that millennial kingdom. Okay, so there's yet another promise that is made over here, in thy seed, which we're going to pick up a little later on in this uh, particular lesson as well. Okay, let's, let's move on. Some more important and interesting little facts involved here, right? The beginning of the fourth day. So this is 3,000 years since Adam. And at the beginning of the fourth day, we encounter David. Okay, so 4,000 years after Adam, we encounter David. Um, and in 2 Samuel chapter 7, verses 12 to 13, it, it, uh, God is continuing to set covenants, of course, with Israel. Right? We are basically into a thousand years of the history of Israel at the moment. God called out Israel via Abraham. All right, and he says to uh, David here, uh, when your days are fulfilled and you are, shall sleep with your fathers, in other words, die, I will set up thy seed after thee, which shall produce, well, sorry, which will proceed out of your bowels, and I will establish his kingdom. Now, let me just mention here, the seed that is being referred to here is, of course, Solomon, right? Solomon was, was David's son, and Solomon, out of Solomon, God would eventually build the temple and so forth. But more than that, the seed here is also, of course, pointing to and uh, used uh, in, in a sort of a reference here to the, the ultimate seed, which is Jesus Christ, who will then rule that kingdom, okay? So the seed here is pointing to Solomon, but it's also in reference to Jesus Christ. All right, it continues here. He will build the house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Now, that kingdom, of course, is the kingdom that Jesus Christ, the ultimate seed, is going to rule. And interesting, within the same passage, 2 Samuel chapter 7, right, just in the beginning of this, it says here, moreover, I will appoint a place for my people Israel, and I will plant them that they may dwell in a place of their own and move no more. Neither shall the children of wickedness afflict them any more. Now that place that is being pointed out over here in, uh, uh, in verse, seven, uh, verse 10 is exactly that millennial kingdom. Okay, so that's why we can allude to the point that the seed here which is in reference to Solomon, is also ultimately in reference to Jesus Christ. Okay, so again, God continuing, notice this seed, pointing out through prophecy of a coming seed from a a Adam all the way through 4,000 years already. Okay, let's continue, right? I have 10 minutes to go. All right, here is... I'd almost like to stop here for a little bit because this is one of my favorite scriptures, which basically points to the fact that we've got to be able to read the Bible, not just 
always on, you know, directly, logically, you know, there's a lot of uh, um, uh, uh, deeper connotations to things as well. And uh, this one just points so clearly to the point. Uh, in Hosea, chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. Now, remember, we're dealing with these thousand-year periods, all right? Uh, Israel has effectively been running or operating now for 2,000 years, from Abraham all the way through to Jesus Christ. So these are 2,000 years, or the, the, the day three and day four. And have a look at what Hosea says here in a prophecy, in Hosea 6, verses 1 and 2. It says, come, let us return to the Lord, for he has torn us, yet he will heal us. Reference, of course, if you know what happened in these 2,000 years, there was uh, Israel was twice in exile, all right, um, by the Assyrians and the Babylonians. Uh, uh, also, if you think in the, in, in the book of the Judges, right, they were up and down and up and down. In other words, Israel believed in God and they were blessed. And then they turned their heart away from God and they were cursed and they were overcome by their enemies and so forth. So it was a, a journey of up and down, right? And this is event, uh, essentially what Jose is saying, that the Lord has torn us, but he will heal us, right? He has smitten us, which basically means he has struck us and beaten us, okay? But he will bind us up. Now, here's the significant part. It says, after two days... Right, these two days, which is two thousand years, effectively, he will after these two days, he will revive us, almost as in give us life. Right, he will pick us up and revive us. Um, in the third day, he will raise us up that we will live in his sight. All right, and that third day, of course, is reference to this rest period, this sabbatical period of Christ's reign, where Israel will be preeminent, no more enemies, they will rest in the land, okay, and this is significant, because it talks about two days, right, those 2,000 years, and after those two days, he will revive us, and bring us in to live in his sight, which is exactly what happens in this, in this day, Jesus comes down, and he lives amongst his people, Israel being the preeminent nation, and they will live in his sight, Okay, now another significant thing, right? Sorry, Sunday, third day, rise up, also refers to Christ rising up uh, in crucifixion. Absolutely, his resurrection, all right? Um, specifically, so Christ rises up from, the, from, from death, but when he comes again at that second coming, he destroys the enemies of Israel and they live in his sight. Okay, the uh, incredible thing about this prophecy, which also speaks to you and I today, is that, it has no reference to day five and six. Okay, it talks here of after two days, he will revive us, and in the third day. Hosea doesn't say, and in the seventh day. So in other words, in Hosea's mind, while he was prophesying this, he was saying, right, two days, Israel was torn and God will heal them, right, up and down and so forth, and on the third day, we will live in his sight. There was absolutely no knowledge um, in the prophet Hosea about this period of time where God would separate that thousand-year kingdom period from Israel's history. Okay, and of course we see this in all the other prophets, Jeremiah, uh, Isaiah, Ezekiel, and the minor prophets. Nowhere do we ever find anywhere in prophecy of this period of time which represents you and I today as the body of Christ, okay? There's, there's just nothing in prophecy about it. So this has always fascinated me, that Hosea saw that after two days, the third day is, right, he didn't see this period uh, where God would actually raise up a whole different creature called the body of Christ, okay? So anyway, we are part of God's plan, but it was a secret at that time. Okay, um, I'm going to start rounding off. Uh, let's just see where this is going to take us. Okay, this is a recap. Okay, so I think next week we will start with this. Uh, we will have a look at our program and uh, a few things that I want to just say within the context of this whole six-day period before the seventh day rest. Uh, we will just chat about that, and then I'll resume further after that with um, what I wanted to deal with in the last two 
weeks of uh, the big picture for this year. Okay. So let me wrap up with this particular slide, which is basically a good place because this is just a recap of everything we've discussed. It says each thousand year, right from the beginning, each 1000 year day is interesting because it represents a point of reference of a notable person. In other words, a person that God raises up to continue the seed, that promised seed. All right. So we see, of course, uh, after the first thousand years, Satan, of course, tried to corrupt the gene pool of man and God preserved that seed promise through Noah. Right. Man becomes vain in his imaginations um, and in uh, the foolishness of their heart, the God, the, their heart was darkened and God gave them up. Right. Which ba which, by the way, was again at Babel. Right. Um, you know what? Something just since I do have a little bit of time here, let me just go back here to this one slide. I want to point out here, this is Genesis chapter six, right? In the days of Noah, it says here that every imagination of the thoughts of their heart was evil continuously. Every imagine the imagination of man. So in other words, these hybrids before Noah, they were imagine, you know, they were they were thinking evil continuously, right? And God had to wipe them out. But uh, notice what happened at Babel, and I hope I actually have the this. I okay, that's David. Let's just get back to here. It is. Um, yes, in the scripture here, talking about Babel. All right, I only read that first part there, but have a look at at this verse right down here at the bottom. It says here, and the Lord said, behold, the people is one and they have one language and this they uh, uh, and this they begin to do. And now nothing will be restrained from them, which they have imagined to do. The point I just want to place here is whenever you encounter the word imagination in the Bible, it generally is wicked. All right. The imagination of man will always go towards wicked. It's never, it, in the Bible, it's never spoken of as a good thing, imagination, right? Obviously, you and I today, uh, with the spirit of Christ within us, right, uh, we can let our minds imagine and, um, you know, the spirit will guide us. But back in that day, imagination was a bad thing. Uh, wickedness of man was uh, always let his imagination run wild. Okay. So just to get back to where I was here, um, here we go. Uh, through Abraham's seed, we come to David, right? In the beginning of the fourth day, uh, God continued to reiterate the promise of the seed, all right? Through Abraham to build a nation and a land, through David to bless him with an everlasting kingdom. So these were the promises associated with the seed uh, as such, that the seed would destroy the head of Satan, Right, and that he would have a kingdom, and that kingdom would be an everlasting kingdom. There would be a land for the kingdom. There would be a nation for that kingdom. So these were the covenants, effectively, that God set up, and even the covenant with Moses. Moses is not in in the setup here, but the the law covenant God made with no, Moses and with Israel set them apart. Okay, so that in that kingdom, in that seventh day the law of Moses would come back into play again. In actual fact, it would be the new covenant, the law of Moses, sorry, would, would actually be scrapped altogether and the law would be of a spiritual nature, all right, um, which is even higher that the Lord will actually allow the, the Jews to be able to live in that, uh, in that format. Okay, uh, if you think in terms of Matthew chapter five and six, the Beatitudes, all right, where Jesus spoke on the Mount of Olives, that whole sermon of the uh, the rules, that's the constitution of that kingdom. And that superseded the law of Moses. Okay. All right. Uh, and then maybe the last point, I can wrap up with this. Did you know that all of scripture, the entire Bible from Genesis to Revelations was written by Jews? Okay. Uh, it says here very clearly, unto the Jews were committed the oracles of God, Romans 3 verse 2. All right, there is no word in scripture that was written by a Gentile. No promises, no prophecy, nothing in the Bible was written by a Gentile. 
All right. Um, so, uh, and if you dispute that point, you're welcome to dispute it if you have some other insights, but uh, you won't convince me because this, this particular scripture tells me that God gave Jews the, uh, he committed the word to the Jews to write the word, to bring the word. And of course, that is why most prophecies, I say most, I could almost say all prophecies pertain to Israel, pertain to that seventh day, that kingdom of God. All right, within the prophecies and within the scriptures is reference to Gentiles and the fact that Gentiles will be saved and so forth through the seed, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. All right, but prophecy is Israel's, and the Bible is 90% is actually referring to that kingdom period of Israel. All right, it's really again just uh, that Romans to Philemon, where Paul writes as the apostle to the Gentiles, and he gives us. Uh, how we live our lives out as Gentiles today. Okay, so um, so there it is. All right, I will re I will continue with this next week, and maybe I can just finish by saying the last two weeks. Once I'm finished with this, I plan to speak about how we live today as Gentiles. You know, I've we've we've come through the the return of Christ in stages. We've divided the word over the last three or four weeks. But uh, it might be useful to end this year by, by just giving you a view into how do you and I live today. If we are to divide the word and separate that which is Israel's from us and separate the promises and the prophecies, right? How are we expected to live today? How does Paul paint a picture of what you and I do today since we are not under law, since we walk by the Spirit, et cetera, et cetera? So um, I, I plan maybe just to go through a session or two with that, just to give you an understanding. If you've never had teaching on that, you know, how do we live as Gentiles today as new creatures separated from the, the, uh, the, the scriptures, uh, you know, that are addressed to Israel?